Hey guys, gals, and non-binary pals. Welcome back to the Trans Atheist. This is episode three of for the first season, and my name is Ariane, your host. So today, I wanted to talk a little bit about a group known as the Proud Boys, and um, if you you if you haven't been that involved in keeping track of what's going on here, you probably mostly know them from the January 6th hearings, from the attacks on, on the Capitol on January 6th. Uh, there have been some uh, charges levied against them uh, since that time. And I was kind of looking at the history just to understand a little bit about where they come from. So they are currently designated as a terrorist group in Canada and New Zealand, groups like the Southern Poverty Law Center in the United States. Uh, refer to them as a hate group. They are a far-right, neo-fascist group, exclusively male, with a focus on kind of the male chauvinism and machismo. Um, the name Proud Boy, which is actually taken from a song from Aladdin, which I found really ironic that a group that is so focused on masculinity would openly call themselves boy. But what's really important here is that their involvement in society, what they're doing, did not stop at January 6th. Um, it is still going on throughout the United States. So as we're coming out of Pride Month right now, uh, we, we've actually seen them have a number of attacks, at least four attacks on drag events. They seem to have a real focus on anti-LGBTQ, particularly anti-trans rhetoric, uh, which is just something that they talk about a great deal and they seem to be dealing with. Uh, the most recent one in Woodland Park, California, 10 Proud Boys showed up to break in to a show at Mojo's Lounge and Bar. Now, this show was a pride performance or a drag performance that they were doing to mark the end of Pride Month. Uh, some reports are saying that basically they tried to bust through the doors while police stood by and watched. Apparently doing not much of anything. None of them were arrested despite trying to break into the bar. They were ultimately pepper sprayed, but not by the police, but by a bar patron keeping them out as they were trying to bust in. And unfortunately, this is not the only the only case with them. Um, looking through the article, and I'd read some of these prior, they um, apparently tried to break in, or did, um, to a uh, drag, drag queen story hour in San Lorenzo Public Library in San Francisco. They attempted to disrupt a Pride Month event at uh, a library in McKinney, Texas, which they were unsuccessful in that case. Um, they entered the St. Joseph Public Library um, in Virginia, uh, in South, B or, or no, pardon me, in South Bend, Indiana, not in Virginia. It was Virginia M. Tut Branch um, to disrupt a fam uh, Rainbow Family Storytime event. So, um, this kind of ties in with the increase that we're currently seeing in anti-LGBT rhetoric, anti-LGBT violence, and hate crimes that are going on throughout the United States right now. Uh, one recent poll, I think it was a GLAD poll, showed that 7 out of 10 LGBT people, um, felt that they were being, that they had been discriminated against um, this year. That is up 11 percentage points from the previous year. And a lot of that has to do with the rhetoric that we're seeing going on right now. Um, if you look back to Florida and the Don't Say Gay Bill, uh, a lot of what you heard, even from some politicians, not just from the right-wing you know, talking heads that tend to get involved in this were referring to LGBT people and allies as groomers. Mm -hmm. 
Now, with groomers, we are directly talking about language that relates to things like molestation. And that's the type of scare tactic that simply by informing or teaching children that LGBT people exist, that, you know, LGBT history is part of classes, even though the simple fact is, is that LGBT people are part of American history, but that classifies you as a groomer. And when that rhetoric first emerged, I was very clear in talking with people around me that that was the type of rhetoric that would be used to incite hate. You know, we talked about in previous podcasts how they're using children as an easy tool. We saw it for years. If you go back to um, the 70s with the Save Our Children uh, group that was headed up by Anita Bryant, at that point in time, it was about focused on gay people um, in public schools and gay people as teachers. And the fear tactic used was that not only were gay people going to convert your children, uh, but also that having them in schools, you'd end up with them in bathrooms with the kids and that the kids were going to be at risk of molestation. Now, of course, none of that has ever panned out to be true. In fact, statistical data tends to show that actually cis white men, straight men, are the you know, biggest group that tends to, unfortunately, be involved in child molestation. And I would argue that your kids are a whole lot safer at a drag queen story hour than they are at your local Catholic church, because we know they have a history of it, and they cover it up. So, this is the rhetoric that's being used. This is why we're seeing um, these anti-trans laws going across the, the country, these anti-gay laws as well. Uh, but right now, the focus really seems to be on, on trans people. And, you know, I've often asked myself why it is, because nine times out of ten, they'll talk about trans girls. And if you notice, even a lot of these sports bills are against trans girls. They a lot of times just totally ignore that trans boys even exist. And, and the reason for that is part of that machismo, male chauvinist, toxic masculinity culture uh, within society where, you know, the masculinity, they don't have quite as much of a problem because with, with trans men and trans boys on that front at least because masculinity is something to be achieved. It's a goal. It's considered a higher state, whereas femininity is less than. It ties right into the sexism of the culture. So the real hatred for trans women, in my opinion, is based on this idea that someone could have a so-called birthright of masculinity and still be willing to freely give it up for this lesser status, in their view, of femininity, of womanhood. So a lot of this has to do with a convergence of sexism, homophobia, and transphobia. In most cases, I think sexism and transphobia are pretty much inseparable. So this is what we are going to continue to see. This is what these laws that are going around and being proposed inspire. When you keep telling everyone that, you know, our transness is something that children need to be protected from, then you are going to inspire hatred against trans people and fear. You know, the fear that we could influence your children. Now, all of a sudden, we're seeing all these kids, you know, transitioning. Well, we're not, actually. Uh, the numbers are not that high. And what you do see is that now there is actual language for it. You know, someone like myself in the 1980s, I didn't have the language of transgender. You know, I knew something was different. I had no idea what it was. 
And it didn't change the fact that I was transgender. It only changed the fact that I knew a word for what I was. And it meant that I spent more years suffering and struggling through needlessly. Whereas there are people here now who have the language, who have the knowledge, and they can avoid many of the, much of the pain and struggle that some of us did uh, during those time frames. Now, it's still going to be a very rough time. I fully anticipate with the Roe v. Wade uh, decision overturning Roe and um, some of the statements that were made by Clarence Thomas in his uh, ruling on that, that within a year, within a year, we will likely see marriage equality eliminated. Um, and we will go back to a time prior to that. Uh, it is very possible that we could even see things like um, sodomy laws being re-implemented in right-wing states to challenge the Supreme Court, and I'm not sure I know where the Supreme Court would fall on an issue like that at this point. Uh, what we are definitely going to see, and we're seeing right now, are laws that will block any type of transition-related care for anyone under the age of 18, and potentially higher. I think that it's very possible that transition-related care, even for older people, could be something that states eventually try to outlaw. You know, we see even the simplest things. Um, when they were talking about this in Florida, the Florida Surgeon General, which is a joke, actually had sent out a, a directive. It was a non-binding directive, but it gave us a lot of insight into what they were what they were thinking. And this directive even discouraged allowing any sort of social transition, which, as a side note, is the only transition available for children, which is just simply going by a different name maybe wearing your hair a little different, changing your clothing, but this was part of what they were against. So it's not simply medical issues that they're talking about. They are literally wanting to eliminate trans people, even calling yourself by a different pronoun or wearing different clothing. That is a massive flashback to the time frame prior to Stonewall. And that is what we are seeing right now. So I guess kind of the moral of the story to my LGBT folk that are listening in, uh, please be careful. Please be watchful. When you're at events that are LGBT focused, please make sure you're keeping an eye on your surroundings. Uh, make sure you're prepared that someone is keeping an eye on the doors, that they, you have an exit plan in place should things get particularly bad um, because I don't think right now we're looking at seeing these type of events go down. I think there's a good chance that they could actually potentially get worse and we need to be prepared for that. We need to look out for ourselves because we can't count on the Supreme Court to do it and sadly in many places we cannot count on the police to do it. We have to count on ourselves and look out for one another and be as prepared as possible. So please be careful. Continue to be involved. Uh, we're coming up on a midterm. Uh, and I can't encourage you enough to ensure that you are registered to vote, that you are there voting when your midterm, when the midterm takes place. We have to make sure that we are getting people in that do not hold to the mentality of the Proud Boys. And that is your current Republican Party. This is the Republican Party that does not believe that women can make decisions for themselves. That's why we end up with a road decision. They need to make it for them. This is a party 
that has very firmly went against LGBTQ people. The GOP platform still includes statements against marriage equality, and that is still something that they are very much so fighting against. If you look at the statements by Clarence Thomas, this is not just some outsider. I mean, he is a Supreme Court justice, but even taking it beyond that, his wife, is a vocal activist within the Republican Party. So you can bet that those things that Clarence Thomas were talking about in his decision, that those are also the things that Jenny Thomas is working towards when she is working within Republican circles. So this is not going away anytime soon. And the only way we are going to stand a chance on this is if we continue to vote, continue to be involved, and then hold those people that we are voting for accountable. You know, I went to an event with a particular um, politician, um, a, moderate, um, pol a moderate Democrat, and while I knew some people probably were not thrilled with my, my question, I asked him to make a commitment to the LGBT community, to trans people, to trans kids, that we are not going to support, that he will, you know, do everything, A, to pass the Equality Act, which honestly is important, but I don't think will stand. I think all that's going to happen is one state is going to sue over it. It's going to go to the Supreme Court. And, well, let's look at our Supreme Court. But that he would continue to fight for the LGBT community. We've got to call people out. We've got to hold them accountable. We've got to be prepared. The Proud Boys, that's one organization. There are other organizations, and not everyone is part of an organization. We still have lone wolf domestic terrorists that are hell-bent on going against the LGBT community. And in a lot of cases, that does involve religious mentality and the mentality that, um, frankly, we see in the evangelical right-wing churches, you know, look up YouTube, TikTok, news sources, and see how many of these statements from some of these right-wing fundamentalist pastors you will see saying that LGBT people should be rounded up and murdered for who we are. There are plenty. We have to be prepared. These people are involved in our government. Not only do they vote, but in some cases they are running for office. We have one from either North or South Carolina. He was the one who gave the invocation at the uh, 2016 Republican convention who was saying that all LGBT people should be charged with treason. That's a capital crime that he wants to charge us with because we are undermining the foundation of America, he says. Voting is important. Elections have consequences. You and I and every LGBT person in the country, we are still dealing with the consequences from 2016. If your ideal candidate does not get the nomination... Vote anyway. Continue to be involved. We can't afford to sit this out. This is a dangerous time for us guys, gals, non-binary pals. This is a time when we have to be involved and we have to make a change because we can't count on anyone to do it for us. So anyway... That was today's little podcast from The Trans Atheist. My name is Ariane, and hopefully I'll see you soon at the next podcast. Have a great day.